Yeah, so, well, that's quite an act to follow. Matt did an awesome job as usual. Um, so uh, I'll hope to be like 70% awesome to that. Uh, that's a good goal. Um, so this is a, a talk about observability. Uh, it's an interesting keyword that's thrown around a lot uh, lately. Um, and uh, one of the things I'll try to do is, is uh, stitch together um, a few, few common uh, tools in that space. Um, so yeah, I work, I work at Pivotal, and I've been mostly working on a Zipkin project. This is not a Zipkin presentation, though. It's, it's hopefully going to be more uh, widely useful. And uh, throughout, I'm, I'm not going to be using books. I'm going to be using basically um, just advice that I've gotten from various people in, in my, my journey in uh, observability. And uh, cr uh, I'll do my best to credit them as they go along. And I have uh, all their uh, Twitter IDs on the back. So the one unifying theory between this stuff is that everything ends up being based on events. Uh, so it's, it's good to think about relating when you, when you have something to glue it all together. And, and so, for example, uh, we know logging is, is recording events. Um, our first applications were like probably Hello World. It's like the first log uh, that we have ever written to console. Um, and um, you know, metrics are an in interesting one because you know, this is where you're taking events and then you're making new events out of them, right? So, so for example, I have a, a bunch of notifications that requests occurred, and now I can convert that into you know, either a rate or a count or, or something like that to, to say that, for example, I'm, I'm now having however many uh, stream starts per second if you're in the movie business. Um, and uh, you know, tracing is also uh, about events, uh, but one of the, the key aspects here is that it's, it's about calls, like which event calls that event to occur. And um, so, that, but at the end of the day, the nice thing is that they're all they're all uh, related, and so we can use use that to try and tease out one from another. And that's Coda Hill, who's who's had made some pretty famous metrics libraries and, and stuff. So if you haven't seen his work, you should. Um, Another way to visualize it, this, this came out of a workshop that I put together um, uh, some couple years ago. And Peter Bergen, uh, who, who was at SoundCloud at the time, uh, was trying to you know, frame all of the information people were talking about and, and use a visual guide. And so this, this was an awesome thing. He actually has a blog about it you can, you can uh, check out. But um, we often hear people talk about like three pillars of observability. You'll see that, that coming around. And one of the nice things is, is to, to visualize it as you know, related, but, uh, but uh, spaces that have focal areas. So, and um, while I don't have lines drawn, there's, there's, also, there's also some ways to associate these tools based on how much volume they produce um, you know, as, as your applications run. I'll get into more of that later. But uh, if, we, if we think about like, uh, like our applications erroring, so, that's, that's where we see like a, an exception in a log file, which is an event, and has like whatever code that forgot to catch a null pointer or whatever. And so, you know, tracing, we can find out the impact of that. Did that actually cause a problem, or is that just fuzz? Um, did it, did it uh, prevent a customer-facing request from succeeding or not? Um, we could also know, well, is this, is this related to um, an overall uh, downgrade in, in, in performance? Uh, how many of these errors are happening uh, per second or per minute? Is that a different amount of errors per second or minute than you had before? Because, like, as your system is always erroring, you know, uh, this this may or may not be um, relevant in the population of, of your whole architecture. So, that, like, there, there's some interesting ways to like take something like an error and move it around. Um, and, and the places where things are related, like. Uh, metrics, uh, we use the word aggregation a lot because they, they're like summaries of information often enough. Uh, whereas logs are, are discrete events, like as they occur, like this is this, this is this. And, um, you know, tracing uh, has an interesting um, thing that, that uh, where metrics are, are oftentimes uh, re request or transaction focused. If we're trying to like understand our, our, our business operations, we might need to know how many requests per second and which endpoints are being hit. Uh, tracing often starts at, a, uh, at an endpoint, like as a customer hits an application or some sort of a scheduled job, job comes off. Um, logging actually has, a, has an interesting thing because it's like a catch-all for all the things. So it, you know, you, you'll have things in your logs like uh, 
garbage collection events and, and other things that have nothing necessarily to do with a, with a customer request, but they could impact it and color it. And, and metrics also show that. So you could see metrics about, if you're in a Java world, time in GC and things like that. So, so there, there are different scopes as well. And, and so um, I don't have time to get through all of it, but I, I really recommend um, looking at Peter Bergen's blog and, and some related material that came out of it. It's a nice way to, to think about how these tools are worked together. And if we want to just pick one thing uh, to, to talk about these things, uh, latency is not a bad one. Um, latency uh, you know, can be visualized or, or scraped from all of these uh, types of tools. And uh, we're talking about now response time. I'm not going to get into nuance of, 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 of how you talk about latency. Let's just call it latency. <laughs> And um, so in a log, like usually you're going to end up looking at an event or, or a pairing of events and, and, and time between them. Uh, metrics is going to be like a value, like you know, this many milliseconds. Um, and a trace would end up being like a breakdown. Like a, you know, this took 50 milliseconds, but then you know, it, it, it was caused by these other things that, that uh, were blocking it. And, you know, so if we jump right into logs, like we can see uh, response time uh, in our logs. If we have a specific format, uh, we might be lucky enough to have latency as like a last field. And so, if you if you have such a thing, then you don't need to like do things like compare timestamps to each other. Uh, if you don't, you have to do things like compare timestamps to each other and hope the clock didn't change in between. Um, but you can get a, a, a good a good uh, sense. Um, of uh, latency, especially in a monolithic system, uh, just by looking at, at um, you know the difference between uh, log statements. Uh, but there is there are some downs downsides to it. Like there's some complexity in the format. Formats, while uh, many are standard, they're not always used in a standard way. And, and of course, there are some problems with clocks. Um, but at any rate, you can you can take a look and and you'd find that this this took uh, 95 milliseconds. Now metrics is an interesting one because it can show you like the relevance, like how how is this in, you know compared to the system, and um, you know if we're if we're monitoring and alerting based on max, then then we'd know that 95 wasn't the max. Um, max was quite higher than that, and one of the things that's interesting about metrics, something I've learned from talking to folks like John Snyder, who who works on the Micrometer project is that um, people often um, misbelieve that there's like normal distributions in systems and there's really none. <laughs> you actually have, if you look at the, this, this uh, heat map here, uh, which, which was like emphasized in color, I'm not sure if it's showing up or not, eh, it's all right. You'll see that there's like bands, like various bands of latency. Like so there's, there's groupings and there is certainly a place where a lot of requests come into play, but it's not a normal distribution. You have quite a lot uh, at this particular point where there's, there's a, like a gap, and then there's, there's a population who have, have different latency characteristics. And, and so you're not going to see like bell curves uh, you know, on, on your, uh, your system performance as much as you might want it to be. Um, so it, it has an interesting uh, knock-on effect if you think that through. Uh, one of John's advice is to you alert on max. Um, but you turn, you, you tune your, your system based on the, the high percentiles. And um, it's an interesting thing. This diagram is, is basically showing some nuance, which is that in some cases, uh, you, you know, your uh, percentiles uh, can be, uh, like your 99 could actually um, be awkwardly uh, related to, to your, your average, and people can kind of misunderstand their, their system if they think of it as like a normal distribution. And th the main idea is that you can't control your max. So uh, you, you can't control whether there was a, a system pause or, or a deployment event that uh, you, you can't do that as a developer, for example. You, you might be able to reduce the impact of it. Um, and uh, so you do want to know when the, those max things happen because there's at least some users involved. You can control your, your things like your 99%, uh, like how, how long did did 99% uh, of the requests take to complete. Uh, you, you can do that, use that to tune either your architecture or your applications themselves. And so, so knowing the difference between how to use these values is, is pretty helpful. And um, you know, that's another one to, to sort of look at other materials, uh, which are plentiful uh, you know, online and in books about, about how to use metrics. 
So, so basically, the, the summary here is, is that you know, you're looking at your system as a whole, uh, and, and you're trying to figure out the relevance here. Usually, you have uh, alerts on, on things that you've decided are relevant, ideally. Otherwise, you're getting spammed. Um, traces are, are, are an individual business request going through the system. So if I hit that 95 milliseconds or 95 microseconds, because we're in microservices, we should use that. Uh, then we would be able to see the breakdown, and maybe we would be able to identify um, the cause of a delay. So if this was taking a little bit longer than we thought, uh, then uh, if we had a trace, we could probably see if there's a visual cue, like yellow meaning a, a transient error occurred. We could sort of play a game in our minds very quickly and decide whether that uh, was worth investigating further or not. Um, and of course, uh, like one of the nice things about having a diagram is you can get multiple people on the same page. Uh, so for example, uh, someone who's convinced that it's a database um, would, would be able to tell, well, it did take um, you know, 10 milliseconds of this. Are we sure that's really the, the thing that was holding it up or not? And uh, so it's a nice way in the, like the DevOps word to sort of um, get people to talk about uh, facts together and, and not like uh, thro throwing things at each other. Though you have to be careful with your diagrams and make sure the data is accurate. Because uh, then it could backfire. Um, anyhow, uh, you're going to have your own takeaways. Um, I mean, as I was talking to folks and gathering this, this is not new. I've been like pittering on this deck for a couple of years now, actually. But um, you know, we definitely know about logs. They, they're everywhere. Like a lot of people don't have metrics even in their environments, uh, but they do have logs. So it's nice to know where things align, and they're they're sort of easy for people to understand. Uh, although they're hard in, in microservices architecture because there's so many different things going on. Um, but like, you know, we definitely, and certainly in, micro, in, um, in monolithic applications, logs are, logs are pretty good. Um, but we can use other tools as well, especially as our system architecture grows, uh, metrics to identify trends or, or, or where, where we should be placing action in general and, and at like more an organizational level. And, and traces can help us understand specific requests inside the system. And uh, you know, as uh, we'll probably have some developers here, like you know, might be wondering, like, well, how do you write code to do this timing stuff, and is there any impact to that? Um, so you can kind of guess that there's some formatting involved with with logs. Uh, metrics is, I think, is the easiest API there is. It's uh, like you have a hole that's shaped <laughs> that only a number can go into, and so you can't really get that uh, that part wrong. Like you can definitely time incorrectly, um, but, but like putting a number where only a number can fit is a pretty nice API. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. And, and, and trace has, has some, some pretty interesting uh, side effects to it, because trace is a stateful, ah, stateful. Uh, but it is actually a very much a stateful type of recording. You have to, in order for causal relationships to work, you have to track uh, lineage. And that's, that's a stateful thing. So there's some interesting parts about that. Um, yeah, jargon alert. The word span is, is a very awkward way of saying in operation that occurred, how long it took. Um, so if I'm doing logging, uh, this probably would look familiar to folks. Uh, you probably see code dumping things. Um, somebody might look at the system time and do some math there and, uh, and format that into a log statement. Um, and uh, you know the, uh, the examples I use are, are literally copy pasted from actual code that people use. Uh, this one was, you know, kind of summarized from some uh, OK HTTP library. Um, whereas, uh, if you're looking at metric or metricing, um, like you probably have a timer-based API, and uh, so in this case, at the end of of some operation of interest, you stuff your, um, you know, any properties or tags like dimensions that you you might need to query by later. Um, so for example, this is a micrometer um, code, in, and I'm just arbitrarily using Scala here. But um, you know, you're probably also going to need to name, name the, the metrics in some way um, and so that you can you know, find them on your dashboards and such. And then you might need some attributes so you can break down by things like status code or, or otherwise. Uh, so, so some of that knowledge has to be in the system. And that's because it's inside a code someplace. And um, you know, tracing is, uh, is a bit different because there's some scoping involved, meaning that uh, you want your downstream operations to know what their parent was. 
So, so oftentimes there's a, there's a, like a span object, which would represent the, the same sort of timing activities, but um, it will take on another responsibility, what's called propagation, meaning that as your request comes in one side of your process, it doesn't get lost by the time it gets to the other side. And that's how you would know that this definitely calls to this to happen. Um, not, not based on timestamp math, but, but by uh, like parent-child relationships. So, so the impact of all this is that, you know, uh, logging, uh, again, is the most familiar thing for, for folks. There's ubiquitous APIs, so people know all of the perils. There's lots of, lots of materials about that for, for dozens of years, I guess. Um, uh, I think metrics, again, I, I, I would, I would uh, uh, conject that it's the easiest API um, because you put in a number and you have the dimensions you need. Uh, but it also has less context. Um, so for example, a metric doesn't know what happened before it, whereas in logs you can like look up if you're just manually looking in logs and figure out what happened before it and after it. Um, but, um, but they definitely have, have, have some really nice attributes to, to them, which, which I'll talk about later too. Um, trace is the hardest thing to code, I think, uh, so I don't recommend that for like your starter package. Um, but, uh, and that's because identifiers that, that keep these parent-child relationships have to be, have to be tracked, um, not just in the process, but as you go to other processes, like for example, in headers and things. Um, and, and I mean, the thing is, is that like I'm talking about how it happens, it doesn't mean everyone should just go now, okay, I'm gonna go write some, some code. The thing is, a lot of frameworks have this already built in, uh, so you don't necessarily need to. Sometimes it's choosing what to turn on. Um, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend walking into some of this code uh, unless you really like it. And if you do, I can find some open source issues for you to address. But uh, because you know, there are lots of edge cases. It's it's super geeky. It's awesome, uh, but it's also like quite niche. Um, and so a lot of times people try to find ways of of getting these values without having to like you know uh, hire up some staff right before they leave for another job. And, and one of the ways you can look at it is like, how do I not code and, and still get value? And uh, so buddies, AKA service mesh, uh, you can have things that, that sit alongside your processes that may be intercepting traffic and you can trace those things. And you can get some black box relationships. Um, it's pretty popular now um, for, for uh, you, know, uh, you know, getting some, some uh, skeletal traces uh, out of the system. Most typical APMs are application performance management companies. They have agents that will connect to your processes and then track you know, everything, like you know, metrics and, and, and all these relationships, uh, business transactions sometimes. Um, and that's basically a process where you have somebody's code, often a vendor, but there are some open source ones out there um, that, that are actually patching your code to make, to make sure that the different things are, are, are um, are being tracked, even if your application was never meant to be tracked. Um, and uh, frameworks work in a different way. It's it's a uh, so for example, if you have libraries that that are um, put together with Spring or something like that, uh, then you will have um, some some uh, configuration options that will that will go ahead and do that. But it might be opinionated, like it might only work in Spring or Dropwiz or whatever. So there, there are some um, different ways and in, in things. And, and also, also uh, you know, I could talk too much, but I just one more thing is that a lot of these have different depths. So, so for example, some tools can see right down to the kernel, um, but some of them can only start at the application layer. Uh, so that there's some some interesting things to think about. Um, the buddies mesh thing, you basically have some intermediary who's intercepting and pretending to be uh, like another service, for example. And so your application makes a call. It thinks it's going to Amazon S3, but it's actually going to a proxy. <laughs> and then that's making a call out somewhere else. Uh, and then those things are, are, are able to add tracing between your, your service calls um, because they're actually doing the service calls for you. Um, there's some interesting things about this. I could, I could talk a long time about it. Um, one of the things are your application, your observability problem actually gets a little bit harder while it gets easier sometimes. So for example, if you have uh, proxies that are doing retries, your application has no idea that retries are occurring. Your logs in your app are just gonna show some time having taken place, they have no idea why. Uh, so there's, there's some interesting um, pros and cons to mesh or like buddies or, or anything else that, that are doing work on behalf of your app. Uh, and what I mean to say here is that um, focusing away from the pros and cons, this is, this is not just, right? so these, these uh, 
uh, agents or, met, or, or um, you know, uh, buddies, they are doing more than just tracing, right? You wouldn't just put in uh, that just to do that. You would, you would be you know, using these to do, uh, you know, advanced traffic routing and, and all sorts of other things. So, so they're they're putting in a lot more than than just uh, performance management. Agents are often focused on on performance. Um, uh, uh, you know, you could you can conceivably have like a routing agent, but it's it's not very common. Uh, and so the way they do this is, is actually code from a from a tool called. Uh, Byte Buddy, uh, which is a really neat uh, project for those who like Java. And essentially what you can do is you can actually go into places where code was never meant to be changed, and we can make it traced. Like, so for example, you can just, it basically is the same as inserting a line inside of someone else's code without their permission. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's a really powerful thing, and that's one of the reasons why agents do that. Uh, they, they do that because they can't control all the libraries. They, the applications may be using several different libraries. Who knows? And, and essentially, there's there's uh, there's some places where where things just can't connect easily uh, by a configuration approach. Um, whereas in frameworks, oftentimes what we're doing is is we're intercepting. Uh, like so, we have some sort of a, a, a process level proxy. So not like a network proxy. Uh, but like inside the app itself, it might be proxying like a, a database interface or or an HTTP uh, API, and then you know as it as your app is trying to call out, it's going to like start timers and stuff, and that that can be done for for tracing, also metrics and logging. Um, so these these are when I say framework tracing, what I mean is that you have some sort of a framework that's configuring things on your behalf. Usually they, there's an enabled property, and so you you turn things on and off. And essentially, it's doing configuration for you. So, so these are ways that you can kind of like leverage. I wouldn't say you just, the code's not happening. It's just you're, you're using code other people have written, which is kind of a nice thing, right? And uh, once you get this, this data going through your system, um, you know, we, we need to start understanding the, the, um, the sort of like architecture impacts. Um, and it's because like you don't want to design a, um, a metrics and monitoring observability pipeline. Uh, that's that's more expensive than your business, right? So you need to understand some things. Uh, maybe you don't personally need to, but these things need to be understood. Um, how data gets into the system? Oftentimes, logging are, are pulling these raw events from applications, and they're putting them into a forwarder, uh, like uh, you know, Beats or any other type of mechanism to to push this into a, a pipeline. Uh, metrics, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm talking about buckets, uh, but like. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later, but essentially, metrics are, are um, you're bundling together a summary of data, like the, like for example, how many requ requests per second in, into a s summary that's 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 pushed somewhere else, and um, and then tracers are are, uh, are doing things uh, like collecting those those data from each of the nodes. And I mean, one of the things is I'm using like near real time and not here. Like oftentimes log parsing and things like the pipeline, uh, you would you would wait for uh, three to five minutes or, or something like that before you can do some queries. Maybe maybe it's faster for you depending on what tools you're using. Metrics often also have a few few minutes delay because oftentimes people can't like humans can't respond faster than that anyway. So like there's no need to necessarily go for like pure real time. Uh, I, I could tell you that like tracing sometimes, at least anecdotally, uh, a lot of times people are a lot more impatient with trace data. They want to know it right now, even if it's like in flight at the moment. And so that has some impacts. And, and, and how you ship data is, is also about user experience. How, how fast uh, does that need to go out there? What kind of buffering is allowed in those cases? And we have tools, obviously. So, like uh, this is like an Elasticsearch Grok plugin in, in play. So, like you could have something that's looking at a log, and and then there's maybe some utilities to help parse out those things. So, even though parsing is a pain, there's there's certainly uh, tools, and, and it's a very understood domain. Uh, and so, if you would need to um, create metrics out of log statements, you could actually do that because you you know you you may have a, a duration stuffed in a, in a log of an application you can't modify because somebody else wrote it and it's just uh, off-the-shelf software. So you can still actually take these raw events and people do it uh, to, to um, you know, create metrics and things and then and also they, they would have some ways of, of figuring out dimensions or ways to roll up data based on IP or other types of stuff. <coughs> Um, while this is a little bit um, low level, it's, it's important to know that 
there's, there's, some, there's some nature about metrics data. Usually you're not sending every single event because that, that's very expensive. Uh, somewhere in the process, it's, it's classifying the data and then incrementing you know, a class. So for example, uh, oftentimes you're not going to get resolution on like I have these many requests and they took exactly 237 milliseconds. Oftentimes there's a range. Um, so, so it would be between a certain this and that value. And that allows you to actually ship less data to get very effective information still. And so some people will use some fancy things like uh, fancy histograms and such. But uh, there's, there's often some sort of a bucketing approach to, to reduce the, the size of the data has to go on the wire. <coughs> And this is, a, this is a naive, like if I were to have a programming interview and say, you know, define how to do something, I, I might, someone might, uh, uh, you know, come up with something like this. Uh, spans are usually like structured data, like JSON, they, they, you know, often enough, or protobuf. And they'll, they'll have some more metadata, because when you're looking at a visual diagram, you, you're going to want to know uh, information per step and what happened, uh, you know, in that step. And so they're, they're, they're a little bit larger, not necessarily like logs where like who knows what people are going to put into them. Um, but there's certainly um, some, some bulk to there, much larger than a number. And you know, so th this feeds into like how, how this stuff grows. So um, logs, uh, we definitely know they grow with volume. But they can also uh, grow with verbosity if somebody turns up a logging level on purpose or by accident uh, to like debug. Then, then you can definitely fill out disks and things. Um, but they can also grow based on application behavior. Uh, if you have exceptions that are going at certain rates, they could be, they could be um, another source of growth. Um, you know, whereas metrics are the, the awesome thing, why everybody uses metrics, is that they're fixed with regards to traffic. So for example, the to ship that you know, 1,000 requests happen per second is not much different data than three requests per second. Uh, so knowing that, that the, the, the number itself can be really large, uh, but still take about the same uh, on the wire, uh, that gives you some interesting tools. So metrics actually grow more about the dimensions that you use to, to look up things, and also how many endpoints uh, are involved. So like there's, there's some interesting things that definitely can grow. And if, for example, uh, you're not careful, not you personally, but if things uh, are accidental, uh, in metrics growing, it's, it's often because the cardinality. For example, uh, people are, are not controlling their endpoints very well. Um, and traces grow with traffic. Like, I mean, they're they're end-to-end -end request related, so they're definitely going to have a relationship. And so there's some interesting ways to uh, think about how to reduce the volume while still holding signal knowing these things. So, I mean, the first thing you find in a lot of people's blogs, they'll have statements like, don't log. You know, and so obviously, the first thing you can do is reduce the source of data and, and uh, you know, filter things down um, and uh, try, try not to do some irrelevant stuff here. Metrics, the way to, to do that is, is to, to like, do meta metrics. Like, if you start having a metrics problem, like, look at things. Uh, do you have metrics that are never, never read, only written? I mean, that's, that's basically the problem of data in general. It's like, if you're trying to reduce it, do you have data out there that by, by its own nature is never, ever read? And, and so, so that's, that's probably a good way. Also coarser grained, meaning that you, you may not need to know, um, historically speaking, what happened on a minute by minute granularity. Maybe you can do that on a five minute or, or something else granularity. Uh, and retention is an interesting one too. So for example, you may have to have a legal requirement to keep logs for a certain time, but that doesn't mean you have to keep your metrics for the exact same amount of time and vice versa. So, so they have different, different things. And tracing what's commonly used is sampling, meaning that I might have uh, a few different uh, requests. Uh, and, and because I have so much traffic, I don't have to keep like, a log of every single type of request that happened. So uh, I'm a couple minutes over, but I did want to Give, give some uh, context. Uh, all these things can be stitched together um, by nature uh, because metrics is not request, you know, request by request. You can't do things like a trace ID won't be a good metrics dimension because that, that uh, that's not a summary at that point. Uh, a trace ID would be an individual request. Um, you can turn everything into a container diagram just by changing the word cluster to pod. You know, but anyway, like you can use things like pod or other type of metadata to to uh, understand these things. 
And one of them is that we're having new information. This is, this is by JBD at Google, an uh, awesome person uh, and, and a great, great blogger, um, where it's showing that you can use, use data in novel ways, like, for example, have representative traces about types of traffic patterns and, tra and, uh, and uh, latency points so that you can get an example of what, what, did, what does a 200 millisecond thing look like you know, without keeping 100% of them. And so at the end of the day, we want to, we want to understand and uh, you know, leverage strengths and not, not, not thinking they're all, all golden hammers. They're actually golden together. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why APMs like to sell these things together. Um, and uh, if you find it helpful, uh, you know, th thank the folks that, that helped me put this together over the years. Um, and, and definitely blame me if, if it's not helpful. I'll post these slides. I know I, I, I ran through it, but thanks a lot for uh, for bearing with me through all of it. I hope the fire hose was fun. <laughs> uh, thank you, Adrian. So we'll follow with the top rate of the question, top voted questions on the vision hall. Open senses, open zipkin, and Jager. Current state of fragmentation in tracing and industry trends. What is the current state of interoperability between these tools? Okay, uh, so the question is interoperability. So, uh, and uh, for Open Census is a, uh, so back in the day, um, Google uh, had a paper called Dapper, uh, which was discussing a tracing system. Uh, that project is, was, was eventually named Census. Uh, and uh, about two years ago, Google started an effort to, to basically open source uh, the client side of that. It's, it's uh, something I participate in. Uh, so that has uh, logging, tracing, and metrics APIs. This is client-side uh, libraries at the moment, although they're working on some tools to um, collect like the data, all the data that came into one pod together. And so that's, that's uh, taking a shape of data formats. So when I talk to sites, the most important thing is data formats. Um, every one of the things that were mentioned, they all actually, for example, accept uh, or export to Zipkin format. So that's, that's been definitely the one that, that is, has been out there. But there are, there, there are certainly things that are going on um, besides data formats. So for example, headers as they go across the system. If you can imagine if you're going from one cloud service to another and you want to continue activity as you get from one place to another, uh, there's some important work that needs to be done there. Uh, and there's a W3C uh, effort. It's the only standard, frankly. People toss the word standard around as if like anything, I just put word open on it and now it's a standard. That, that doesn't work in real life. Uh, so in real life, you have to go through standards processes and uh, to call it really a standard. Uh, and uh, W3C uh, uh, has a distributed tracing uh, group that this first uh, deliverable is a, is a header standard, which is, um, has a lot of good work from uh, Google and Microsoft. And, and I've, I've also put a lot of effort into that too. And so that would be like, for example, right now there's a de facto, for example, this thing called B3, which is used between systems. But we're trying to make one uh, which, would, which would be able to retain uh, vendor information as you go from one system to another. So if you're interested in that, it's called trace context. So uh, as you're going through the system, trace context is one standard thing. And on the other side, we definitely have um, a lot of folks who, are, who have used the uh, Zipkin data format. Uh, all of those tools accept it. And all of those tools also have, have their own formats. So, uh, but, but when... Uh, you think about that, the interop is always about data. So that's the answer. <laughs> uh, thank you for the answer. The second question, another short question. Uh, what is the quick fix to a minimum observability to legacy software and custom off-the-shelf software? The minimum work uh, is, is oftentimes, well, first off, legacy means different things. Uh, if you do have an agent, uh, if you can deploy an agent, uh, that can give you insight into what's going on in the app as well as what's going, going on between app to app. So, uh, so for example, there's an interesting Apache project called Skywalking, which, which uh, for Java apps, uh, and I think also .NET now uh, as well, maybe even Node, uh, they have uh, some tools to show um, all of these things together. That's, that's actually a project that came out of China, uh, and um, that's a really neat one. Uh, also, uh, just leverage frameworks. Uh, so for example, um, in, in uh, one of the projects that I work on, Brave, uh, we have some like just even Spring XML that you can put inside of an app to, to have it start um, start sending uh, trace data. But oftentimes, I would say the easy button tends to be agent in nature. Um, and for folks who can't do that, sometimes they turn to like service mesh uh, to do that. 
Um, and uh, but you know, it, it, legacy is often not service mesh. So 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 honestly, it ends up being framework or agents. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Can we have one more round of applause?